The Philosophy of Composition. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Matthew M. Perry. The Philosophy of Composition by Edgar Allan Poe, published in 1846. Charles Dickens, in a note now lying before me, alluding to an examination I once made of the mechanism of Barnaby Rude, says, By the way, are you aware that Godwin wrote his Caleb Williams backwards? He first involved his hero in a web of difficulties, forming the second volume, and then, for the first, cast about him for some mode of accounting for what had been done. I cannot think this the precise mode of procedure on the part of Godwin, and indeed what he himself acknowledges is not altogether in accordance with Mr. Dickens's idea, but the author of Caleb Williams was too good an artist not to perceive the advantage derivable from at least a somewhat similar process. Nothing is more clear than that every plot worth the name must be elaborated to its denouement before anything be attempted with the pen. It is only with the denouement constantly in view that we can give a plot its indispensable air of consequence or causation by making the incidents, and especially the tone at all points, tend to the development of the intention. There's a radical error, I think, in the usual mode of constructing a story. Either history affords a thesis, or one is suggested by an incident of the day, or, at best, the author sets himself to work in the combination of striking events to form merely the basis of his narrative, designing, generally, to fill in with description, dialogue, or autorial comment, whatever crevices of fact or action may, from page to page, render themselves apparent. I prefer commencing with the consideration of an effect. Keeping originality always in view, for he is false to himself who ventures to dispense with so obvious and so easily attainable a source of interest, I say to myself, in the first place, of the innumerable effects or impressions of which the heart, the intellect, or, more generally, the soul is susceptible, what one shall I, on the present occasion, select, having chosen a novel first, and secondly, a vivid effect, I consider whether it can be best wrought by incident or tone, whether by ordinary incidents and peculiar tone, or the converse, or by peculiarity both of incident and tone, afterward looking about me, or rather within, for such combinations of event or tone as shall best aid me in the construction of the effect. I have often thought how interesting a magazine paper might be written by any author who would, that is to say, who could, detail, step by step, the process by which any one of his compositions attained its ultimate point of completion. Why such a paper has never been given to the world, I am much at a loss to say, but Perhaps the autorial vanity has more to do with the omission than any one other cause. Most writers, poets in especial, prefer having it understood that they compose by a species of fine frenzy, an ecstatic intuition, and would positively shudder at letting the public take a peep behind the scenes at the elaborate and vacillating crudities of thought, at the true purposes seized only at the last moment, at the innumerable glimpses of idea that arrived not at the maturity of full view, at the fully matured fancies discarded in despair as unimaginable, at the cautious selections and rejections, at the painful erasures and interpolations, in a word, at the wheels and pinions, the tackle for scene shifting, the step ladders and demon traps, the cock's feathers, the red paint and the black patches which, in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred, constitute the properties of the literary historio. I am aware, on the other hand, that the case is by no means common in which an author is at all in condition to retrace the steps by which his conclusions have been attained. In general, 
suggestions having arisen pell-mell are pursued and forgotten in a similar manner. For my own part, I have neither sympathy with the repugnance alluded to, nor, at any time, the least difficulty in recalling to mind the progressive steps of any of my compositions, and, since the interest of an analysis or reconstruction, such as I have considered a desideratum, is quite independent of any real or fancied interest in the thing analyzed, it will not be regarded as a breach of decorum on my part to show the modus operandi by which some of my own works was put together. I select the raven as most generally known. It is my design to render it manifest that no one point in its composition is referable either to accident or intuition, that the work proceeded step by step to its completion with the precision and rigid consequence of a mathematical problem. Let us dismiss, as irrelevant to the poem per se, the circumstance, or say, the necessity, which, in the first place, gave rise to the intention of composing a poem that should suit at once the popular and the critical taste. We commence, then, with this intention. The initial consideration was that of extent. If any literary work is too long to be read at one sitting, we must be content to dispense with the immensely important effect derivable from unity of impression. For, if two sittings be required, the affairs of the world interfere, and everything like totality is at once destroyed. But since, ceteris paribus, no poet can afford to dispense with anything that may advance his design, it but remains to be seen whether there is, in extent, any advantage to counterbalance the loss of unity which attends it. Here I say no, at once. What we term a long poem is, in fact, merely a succession of brief ones, that is to say, of brief poetical effects. It is needless to demonstrate that a poem is such only inasmuch as it intensely excites by elevating the soul, and all intense excitements are, through a psychical necessity, brief. For this reason, at least, one half of the paradise lost is essentially prose, a succession of poetical excitements interspersed inevitably with corresponding depressions. The whole being deprived, through the extremities of its length, of the vastly important artistic element, totality, or unity of effect. It appears evident, then, that there is a distinct limit as regards length to all works of literary art, the limit of a single sitting, and that, although in certain classes of prose composition, such as Robinson Crusoe, demanding no unity, this limit may be advantageously overpassed, it can never properly be overpassed in a poem. Within this limit, the extent of a poem may be made to bear mathematical relation to its merit, in other words, to the excitement or elevation, again, in other words, to the degree of the true poetical effect which it is capable of inducing. For it is clear that the brevity must be in direct ratio of the intensity of the intended effect. This, with one provisio, that a certain degree of duration is absolutely requisite for the production of any effect at all. Holding in view these considerations, as well as that degree of excitement which I deemed not above the popular, while not below the critical taste, I reached at once what I conceived the proper length for my intended poem, a length of about one hundred lines. It is, in fact, a hundred and eight. My next thought concerned the choice of an impression or effect to be conveyed, and here I may as well observe that throughout the construction I kept steadily in view the design of rendering the work universally appreciable. I should be carried too far out of my immediate topic were I to demonstrate a point which I have repeatedly insisted, and which, with the poetical, stands not in the slightest need of demonstration. The point... I mean, that beauty is the sole legitimate province of the poem. A few words, however, in euclidiation of my real meaning, which some of my friends have evinced a dispossession to misrepresent, that pleasure, which is at once the most intense, the most elevating, and the most pure, is, I believe, found in the contemplation of the beautiful, when, 
Indeed, men speak of beauty. They mean precisely not a quality, as is supposed, but an effect. They refer, in short, just to that intense and pure elevation of the soul, not of intellect or of heart, upon which I have commented, and which is experienced in the consequence of contemplating the beautiful. Now, I designate beauty as the province of the poem merely because it is an obvious rule of art that effects should be made to spring from direct causes, that objects should be attained through means best adapted for their attainment. No one, as yet, having been weak enough to deny that the peculiar elevation alluded to is most readily attained in the poem. Now, the object truth, or the satisfaction of the intellect, and the object passion, or the excitement of the heart, are, although attainable to a certain extent in poetry, far more readily attainable in prose. Truth, in fact, demands a precision, and passion, a homeliness, the truly passionate will comprehend me which are absolutely antagonistic to that beauty which, I maintain, is the excitement or pleasurable elevation of the soul. It by no means follows, from anything here said, that passion, or even truth, may not be introduced, and even profitably introduced, into a poem, for they may serve in euclidiation, or aid the general effect, as do discords in music, by contrast. But the true artist will always contrive, first, to tone them into proper subservience to the predominant aim, and, secondly, to unveil them, as far as possible, in that beauty which is the atmosphere and essence of the poem. Regarding, then, beauty is my province, my next question referred to the tone of its highest manifestation, and all experience has shown that this tone is one of sadness. Beauty of whatever kind in its supreme development invariably excites the sensitive soul to tears. Melancholy is thus the most legitimate of all the poetical tones. The length, the province, and the tone being thus determined, I betook myself to ordinary induction with the view of obtaining some artistic piquancy which might serve me as a keynote in the construction of the poem, some pivot upon which the whole structure might turn. In carefully thinking over all the usual artistic effects, or more properly points in the theatrical sense, I did not fail to perceive immediately that no one had been so universally employed as that of the refrain. The universality of its employment sufficed to assure me of its intrinsic value and spared me the necessity of submitting it to analysis. I consider it, however, with regard to its susceptibility of improvement and soon saw it to be in a primitive condition. As commonly used, the refrain or burden not only is limited to lyric verse, but depends for its impression upon the force of monotone, both in sound and thought. The pleasure is deduced solely from the sense of identity, of repetition. I resolved to diversify, and so heighten the effect, by adhering in general to the monotone of sound, while I continually varied that of thought, that is to say, I determined to produce continually novel effects by variation of the application of the refrain, the refrain itself remaining, for the most part, unvaried. These points being settled, I next bethought me of the nature of my refrain. Since its application was to be repeatedly varied, it was clear that the refrain itself must be brief, for there would have been an insurmountable difficulty in frequent variations of application in any sense of length. In proportion to the brevity of the sentence would, of course, be the facility of the variation. This led me at once to a single word as the best refrain. The question now arose as to the character of the word. Having made up my mind to a refrain, the division of the poem into stanzas was of course a corollary, the refrain forming the close to each stanza. That such a close, to have force, must be sonorous and susceptible of protracted emphasis, admitted no doubt, and these considerations inevitably led me to the long O as the most sonorous vowel in connection with R as the most producible consonant. The sound of the refrain being thus determined, it became necessary to select a word embodying this sound, and at the same time in its fullest possible keeping with that melancholy which I had predetermined as the tone of the poem.
In such a search, it would have been absolutely impossible to overlook the word nevermore. In fact, it was the very first which presented itself. The next desideratum was a pretext for the continuous use of the one word nevermore. In observing the difficulty which I had at once found in inventing a sufficiently plausible reason for its continuous repetition, I did not fail to perceive that this difficulty arose solely from the preassumption that the word was to be so continuously or monotonously spoken by a human being. I did not fail to perceive, in short, that the difficulty lay in the reconciliation of this monotony with the exercise of reason on the part of the creature repeating the word. Here, then, immediately arose the idea of a non-reasoning creature capable of speech, and very naturally a parrot, in the first instance, suggested itself, but was superseded forthwith by a raven as equally capable of speech, and infinitely more in keeping with the intended tone. I had now gone so far as the conception of a raven, the bird of ill omen, monotonously repeating the one word, nevermore, at the conclusion of each stanza in a poem of melancholy tone and in length of about one hundred lines, now, never losing sight of the object, supremeness or perfection at all points, I asked myself, of all melancholy topics, what, according to the universal understanding of mankind, is the most melancholy? Death was the obvious reply. And when, I said, is this most melancholy of topics most poetical? From what I have already explained at some length, the answer here also is obvious. When it most closely allies itself to beauty, the death, then, of a beautiful woman is unquestionably the most poetical topic in the world, and equally is it beyond doubt that the lips best suited for such a topic are those of a bereaved lover. I had now to combine the two ideas of a lover lamenting his deceased mistress and a raven continuously repeating the word nevermore. I had to combine these, bearing in mind my design of varying at every turn the application of the word repeated, but the only intelligible mode of such combination is that of imagining the raven employing the word in answer to the queries of the lover. And here it was that I saw at once the opportunity afforded for the effect on which I had been depending, that is to say, the effect of the variation of application. I saw that I could make the first query propounded by the lover, the first query to which the raven should reply, nevermore, that I could make this first query a commonplace one, the second less so, the third still less, and so on, until at greater length the lover, startled from his original nonchalance by the melancholy character of the word itself, by its frequent repetition, and a consideration of the ominous reputation of the fowl that uttered it, is at length excited to superstition, and wildly propounds queries of a far different character, queries whose solution he has passionately at heart, propounds them half in superstition and half that species of despair which delights in self-torture, propounds them not altogether because he believes in the prophetic or demonic character of the bird, which, reason assures him, is merely repeating a lesson learned by rote, but because he experiences a frenzied pleasure in so modeling his questions as to receive from the expected nevermore the most delicious because the most intolerable of sorrows. Perceiving the opportunity thus afforded me, or, more strictly, thus forced upon me in the progress of the construction, I first enabled in my mind the climax or concluding query, that query to which nevermore should be in the last place an answer, that query in reply to which this word nevermore should involve the utmost conceivable amount of sorrow and despair. Here then the poem may be said to have had its beginning, at the end, where all works of art should begin. For it was here, at this point of my preconsiderations, that I first put pen to paper in the composition of the stanza. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by the God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, if, within the distant Eden, it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore, 
clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, quoth the raven, nevermore. I composed this stanza at this point, first that, by establishing the climax, I might the better vary and graduate, as regards seriousness and importance, the preceding queries of the lover, and secondly, that I might definitely settle the rhythm, the meter, and the length and general arrangement of the stanza, as well as graduate the stanzas which were to proceed, so that none of them might surpass this in rhythmical effect. Had I been able in the subsequent composition to construct more vigorous stanzas, I should, without scruple, have purposely enfeebled them so as not to interfere with the climactic effect. And here I may as well say a few words of the versification. My first object, as usual, was originality. The extent to which this has been neglected in versification is one of the most unaccountable things in the world. Admitting that there is little possibility of variety in mere rhythm, it is still clear that the possible varieties of meter and stanza are absolutely infinite, and yet, for centuries, no man in verse has ever done, or ever seemed to think of doing, an original thing. The fact is that originality, unless in the minds of very unusual force, is by no means a matter, as some suppose, of impulse or intuition. In general, to be found, it must be elaborately sought, and although a positive merit of the highest class demands in its attainment less of invention than negation. Of course, I pretend to no originality in either the rhythm or meter of the raven. The former is trochaic, the latter is octometer acatalytic, alternating with heptameter catalytic, repeated in the refrain of the fifth verse and terminating with tetrameter catalytic. Less pedantically, the feet employed throughout, trochies, consist of a long syllable followed by a short. The first line of the stanza consists of eight of these feet, the second of seven and a half, it affect two-thirds, the third of eight, the fourth of seven and a half, the fifth of the same, the sixth three and a half. Now, each of these lines taken individually has been employed before, and what originality the raven has is in their combination into stanza. Nothing even remotely approaching this has ever been attempted. The effect of this originality of combination is aided by other unusual and some altogether novel effects, arising from an extension of the application of the principles of rhyme and alliteration. The next point to be considered was the mode of bringing together the lover and the raven, and the first branch of this consideration was the locale. For this, the most natural suggestion might seem to be a forest or the fields, but it has always appeared to me that a close circumspection of space is absolutely necessary to the effect of insulated incident. It has the force of a frame to a picture. It has an indisputable moral power in keeping concentrated the attention and, of course, must not be confounded with mere unity of place. I determined then to place the lover in his chamber, in a chamber rendered sacred to him by memories of her who had frequented it. The room is represented as richly furnished. This is in mere pursuance of the ideas I have already explained on the subject of beauty as the sole true poetical thesis. The locale being thus determined, I had now to introduce the bird, and the thought of introducing him through the window was inevitable. The idea of making the lover suppose, in the first instance, that the flapping of the wings of the bird against the shutter is a tapping at the door, originated in a wish to do increase by prolonging the reader's curiosity, and in a desire to admit the incidental effect arising from the lover's throwing open the door, finding all dark, and thence adopting the half-fancy that it was the spirit of his mistress that knocked. I made the night tempestuous, first to account for the raven seeking admission, and secondly for the effect of contrast with the physical serenity within the chamber. I made the bird alight on the bust of Pallas, also for the effect of contrast between the marble and the plumage. It being understood that the bust was absolutely suggested by the bird, the bust of Pallas being chosen, first, as most in keeping with the scholarship of the lover, and secondly, for the seriousness of the word, Pallas, itself. 
About the middle of the poem, also, I have availed myself of the force of contrast with a view of deepening the ultimate impression. For example, an air of the fantastic, approaching as nearly to the ludicrous as was admissible, is given to the raven's entrance. He comes in, quote, with many a flirt and flutter. Not the least obeisance made he, not a moment stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door. In the two stanzas which follow, the design is more obviously carried out. Then this ebony bird, beguiling my sad fancy into smiling, by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore, Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven, wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such a name as Nevermore. The effect of the denouement being thus provided for, I immediately dropped the fantastic for a tone of the most profound seriousness, this tone commencing in the stanza directly following the last one quoted with the line, but the raven, sitting lonely on that placid bus, spoke only, etc. From this epoch, the lover no longer jests, no longer sees anything even of the fantastic in the raven's demeanor. He speaks of him as a grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore, and feels the fiery eyes burning into his bosom's core. This revolution of thought or fancy on the lover's part is intended to induce a similar one on the part of the reader to bring the mind into a proper frame for the denouement which is now brought about as rapidly and as directly as possible with the denouement proper with the raven's reply nevermore to the lover's final demand if he shall meet his mistress in another world the poem, in its obvious phase, that of a simple narrative, may be said to have had its completion. So far, everything is within the limits of the accountable, of the real. A raven, having learned by rote the single word nevermore, and having escaped from the custody of its owner, is driven at midnight through the violence of a storm to seek admission at a window from which a light still gleams, the chamber window of a student occupied half in poring over a volume, half in dreaming of a beloved mistress deceased, the casement being thrown open at the fluttering of the bird's wings, the bird itself perches on the most convenient seat out of the immediate reach of the student, who, amused by the incident and the oddity of the visitor's demeanor, demands of it in jest and without looking for a reply its name. The raven, addressed answers with its customary word, nevermore, a word which finds immediate echo in the melancholy heart of the student, who, giving utterance aloud to certain thoughts suggested by the occasion, is again startled by the fowl's repetition of nevermore. The student now guesses the state of the case, but is impelled, as I have before explained, by the human thirst for self-torture, and in part by superstition, to propound such queries to the bird as will bring him, the lover, the most of the luxury of sorrow, through the anticipated answer, nevermore. With the indulgence to the extreme of this self-torture, the narration, in what I have deemed its first or obvious phase, has a natural termination, and so far there has been no overstepping of the limits of the real. But in subjects so handled, however skillfully, or with however vivid an array of incident, there is always a certain hardness or nakedness which repels the artistical eye. Two things are invariably required. First, some amount of complexity, or more properly, adaptation. And secondly, some amount of suggestiveness, some undercurrent, however indefinite, of meaning. It is this latter, in especial, which imparts to a work of art so much of that richness, 
to borrow from colloquially a forcible term, which we are too fond of confusing with the ideal. It is the excess of the suggested meaning. It is the rendering of this upper instead of the undercurrent of the theme, which turns into prose, and that of the very flattest kind, the so-called poetry of the so-called transcendentalists. Holding these opinions, I added the two concluding stanzas of the poem, their suggestiveness being thus made to pervade all the narrative which has preceded them. The undercurrent of meaning is rendered first apparent in the line, Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door, quoth the raven, nevermore. It will be observed that the words, from out my heart, involve the first metaphorical expression in the poem. They, with the answer, nevermore, dispose the mind to seek a moral in all that has been previously narrated. The reader begins now to regard the raven as emblematical, but it is not until the very last line of the very last stanza that the intention of making him emblematical of mournful and never-ending remembrance is permitted distinctly to be seen. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door, and his eyes have all the seeming of a demon that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor, and my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. End of essay. This recording is in the public domain.